Hello. Hi, Sabina. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Is that how to pronounce your name, Sabina? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And can you teach me how to pronounce? Um, I think it's Jacob's name. Jacob. 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 And, yeah. and his last name is Jeremko. Jeremko. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um. So we probably don't need the recording until the seminar actually starts. To help them. Help them. Um, Sorry, I just got a notification that popped up there. <laughs> um, help move organizations uh, along the AI adoption spectrum in a successful and sustainable way. And no matter where a company is or where you are on the spectrum or where you hope to end up, uh, we're here to help organizations and startups uh, move along that spectrum. But jumping right into a little introduction for our, uh, our speaker here today. So fellow and Canadian CIFAR AI chair at Amy, Jacob Jeremko is a clinical scientist, currently an associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Alberta, a practicing pedi uh, pediatric and muscul musculoskeletal radiologist and partner at the medical, Im at medical imaging consultants. Uh, he is a co also the co-founder of Meadow AI. His research, research has focused on the influence of anatomy and childhood development of joints on the development of adult osteoarthritis. Seeking to develop objective imaging biomarkers of disease, he has generated 3D ultrasound tools for assessment of infant hip dysplasia and semi-qualitative MRI scoring systems for arthritis. Uh, medical images are becoming easier to acquire than, uh, than to interpret reliably. Dr. Jeremko is increasingly focused on automating medical image analysis, particularly in ultrasound using artificial intelligence. Tools from natural image and video processing can be adapted to medical image analysis with special attention to problems such as small training data sets and extreme class imbalance. A handheld ultrasound probe with AI image interpretation could ultimately be used by clinicians at any point of care, becoming the 21st century stethoscope. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Jacob, and I will turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you very much, Adam, for your introduction. That's great. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, uh, it's exciting to talk to everybody. Um, I just need to share my screen here. Um, just a moment. It, uh, it said I couldn't share. There we go. Now I can share. So, um, yeah, so uh, the, the title of the talk today, as you saw, is, to, is starting up from academia. And um, what we're uh, trying to do here um, is show you what it's like. Uh, just basically, it's the story, my experience um, with Meadow uh, starting up this company. So um, my current roles, as you've uh, put in the introduction, I have uh, several hats um, that I wear and just wanted to highlight that I'm a partner at Medical Imaging Consultants, which is uh, uh, Canada's largest radiology partnership, in addition to um, uh, University of Alberta associate professor. Those are my sort of core um, you know, academic and clinical appointments. And then I've, I've been blessed with this CIFAR AI chair. I'm the only clinician who has this, uh, there are about a hundred uh, CIFAR AI chairs and everybody else is not a physician. So I feel very lucky to have that award as well. And uh, especially to be part of the fellowship in Amy. So um, lots of different hats and roles. Um, what we're gonna do in this presentation is discuss um, uh, Meadow.ai, which is an Edmonton-based uh, medical imaging startup company. Uh, we'll talk about um, the origins of this, uh, the academic origins of this, and the transition story from uh, academic to commercial enterprise for it. And so this is an origin story. You know, how did Peter Parker become Spider-Man? How did an academic uh, idea transform into something that uh, has FDA approved products and uh, is uh, you know, a startup company employing a whole bunch of people. Um, so I'll just start with my origins. Um, I'm, uh, I, my grandparents are from all over the world, but I'm I really uh, heavily Alberta, you know, Alberta roots, um, Elk Point and Rosebud. I was born in Calgary. Um, my family has a long history in Alberta. That's uh, Edith Markstad was uh, one, of, um, one of Alberta's first uh, nurse practitioners and that's a plaque to, in her honor at the University Hospital. So I have strong roots here. Um, 
I did uh, my first training was as a civil engineer. So I did a bachelor's degree in civil engineering back when you actually did drafting by hand. That's a sketch of a bridge design that I was making uh, by hand and I was interested in roads and things. I moved on from there to uh, biomedical engineering and um, the project that I was working on there was relating surface and spine deformity in scoliosis in the late 1990s, back when uh, GAN stood for genetic algorithm neural networks instead of gener generative adversarial networks. Um, so we were using primitive neural networks back then. You had to uh, enter in just a few numeric indices and then it had several layers uh, of nodes and links and it processed it uh, uh, in a very simplified representation of how the human, uh, um, of how neurons work in, in humans. Um, so it was a very early sort of uh, dinosaur era of uh, neural networks, uh, but it, that uh, I cut my teeth back then. And then I went and did some clinical training, uh, quite a bit of clinical training. So I did uh, medical school in Calgary, uh, five years of radiology residency in Edmonton. And then I went away for subspecialty training in Melbourne and Boston um, to learn to, to do pediatric and musculoskeletal radiology. So after all of that, uh, some might argue I'm a little bit overeducated. I have 19 years of post-secondary education. Um, so during all of this, um, the idea was hatched. Uh, that, that led to Meadow. So during my fellowship training in Melbourne, I was working with a sonographer named Kane, who is about you know nearly seven feet tall and towers over his uh, pediatric patients. And he's been scanning hundreds and hundreds of infants uh, for years, looking at uh, whether their hips are normal or dysplastic. And so his um, question uh, with me was, why don't we look at the whole 3D shape of the hip? Why are we looking at just one picture, one slice of the hip? When, when the person's hip um, is a 3D structure. And so uh, we thought, yeah, we should be looking at that. So that, that was the idea. So I'll just tell you the, the problem that Meadow was, uh, has come to solve initially is this um, issue of developmental dysplasia of the hip. So just to explain a bit about that, um, this is a common condition. Um, it involves about one in a hundred people. And um, what happens is you have an abnormal bone um, the shape of your hip bone is abnormal, which leads to an unstable joint and premature arthritis. So um, the patients, the, the hip on the left, um, hopefully you can see my mouse, but on the right side of the screen um, is, uh, on the right side of the screen is normal hip. And on the left side of the hip screen is, um, is a dysplastic hip. And um, when it's a normal hip, the load from your, uh, from your when you're standing on it uh, meets bone. And so it's held stable. But if it's a dysplastic hip, then the shape of the acetabulum is really curved and uh, the hip might be subluxed or displaced a bit. So that load doesn't land on a solid platform and the hip is unstable. And that also destroys the hips. You get arthritis uh, in your twenties or thirties. And, um, and, and you know, of course, if you have hip arthritis, you become very disabled. The, the key thing about hip dysplasia is it's completely preventable, almost completely preventable if it's detected in infancy. So if you pick it up on ultrasound, when the, baby is, when the baby's hips are still soft cartilage, then you can put a simple pavlic harness, which is like a brace, a soft brace, and you wear it for a couple of months. And at the end of that, the hip is fine. So, um, so we need to detect this uh, hip dysplasia in infancy, but it's surprisingly hard to do. Now, ideally we would have an MRI with a 3D reconstruction showing the entire shape of the hip. And from that, you would be able to tell what's wrong with it. But what actually happens um, is that we have ultrasound with grainy images that are difficult for people to interpret and difficult to acquire. And um, uh, we're looking at one slice of the middle of the hip. So my first work when I came uh, back to Edmonton and had a consultant position was to uh, research um, what would happen if we did do 3D ultrasound of the hip. And so when people are doing the scan, they, you know, if you're holding a handheld ultrasound, you end up moving it. And so when you're, um, if you have it in a slightly different position, you can see at the lower left, people moving the probe in different positions, then you get um, images that you know, make, make the hip look almost whatever way you want it to look. And we showed that the same hip in a normal patient could have a normal alpha angle or an abnormal dysplastic appearance, um, just depending on where you put the probe. And so um, 
you know, we thought this justifies the idea that maybe we should be doing 3D ultrasound. And so um, at this point, uh, uh, 2014, my uh, postdoctoral fellow Dornouche, uh, who you can see here, um, came and we started scanning babies um, with uh, this big chunky 3D probe, which manually sweeps through a range of, uh, of the hip and generates 200 slices um, in about three seconds. So you can get a better model of the hip. So what we were doing with that is taking the 3D images and seeing, is the hip normal or dysplastic? If it's normal, there's a sharp alpha angle greater than 60 degrees. If it's dysplastic, that angle is quite a bit rounder and, and lower. So if you look at the sweep images, I think you can see visually, if you watch the edge of the acetabulum, you can see it's sharp on the left and it's round on the right. And that's the difference between normal and dysplastic. So it becomes pretty obvious. So the problem is that this is, you know, if we wanted to make models of this, you know, 3D surface models is very tedious. It's a labor of love, like the lady painting there. It's taking, you know, it takes hours to scan, to, to automate, it takes hours to manually locate all the landmarks and all the slices. So we asked ourselves pretty quickly, is there a way we can automate this? Um, and then in fact, when we thought of that, we had this idea that maybe if it could be automated, you could even commercialize it. And this is really the, the light bulb going off, uh, Dornush and I talking about this. Um, so essentially the concept would be any baby could get a scan and uh, the computer could analyze automatically the shape of the hip and then could come back with a check mark, yes, this baby's fine, or oh no, the baby's dysplastic. And then you could do this quite inexpensively and screen the whole population. So that was the idea. And, and the, the point of commercializing it is that, you know, you, you, if you want to make something like this work and actually happen in real life, it needs a commercial product. Um, so before we got there, we did some uh, um, artificial intelligence work uh, with the AI was developing so that it could read images at this time. And so we tried it um, in a couple of different ways. There's shape analysis where the neural network identifies the anatomy and then outputs the anatomy um, and then you can do conventional methods to make measurements. And then there's an end-to-end -end version, of course, where you take all of that network and then you add to the end of it a connect, fully connected layer like those original old neural networks that I was using 20 years ago and predict whether the hip is normal or dysplastic, like to get that check mark or the X uh, all the way straight through completely automatically. So we had some fun with that because um, the neural networks were just developing and um, the, the ultrasound is very noisy pictures. It's quite hard to analyze. Um, so we did uh, some uh, deep learning uh, tool, the various different networks we tried. We tried some 2D and 3D convolutional networks, trying to use information from adjacent slices, trying pre-processing. And as you can see, the first ones we were kind of overshooting, like identifying the bone uh, as well as a bunch of other parts. Then we got uh, the network was a bit restrictive, but it didn't see everything. It was kind of undershooting. Um, and then eventually we figured it out. So you could see the, the bone and the um, femoral head uh, properly identified. Um, and we published it. We had a big publication in the journal Radiology, which showed the key finding here is that this uh, yellow part of the pie dropped from 8% to 2%. And these are the borderline cases. And so what this showed was that using the 3D ultrasound resulted in a uh, three quarters decrease in the number of borderline cases, which would make it a much more effective screening tool in the population, much less costly to keep bringing people back over and over again. Um, so basically what we did is we developed a tool from an academic point of view that showed that if you did this scan, um, and applied it a certain way that you would uh, be able to reduce the amount of hip dysplasia. Um, so that's great. That was the, the purely academic side of it. Um, you know, great to have, but like, how do we get people to actually start scanning hips this way? And that's when the path to commercialization started. And um, I can't take credit for that because this was Dornoosh, my computer scientist, uh, postdoctoral fellow. She was an outstanding computer scientist. She came, from, uh, came originally from Iran and uh, got trained at a top university in Singapore and um, came to me with a full scholarship from uh, Alberta Innovates. And um, she um, was dreaming though. I was offering her a job after the postdoctoral fellowship and she was you know, just thinking, what can I do? You know, should I join the army? You know, all, 
free food games pay? Um, or should I go and join as an individual, leave with a company? So she was dreaming of uh, becoming the CEO, building a company. Um, and she discovered this six month boot camp called Entrepreneurs First, um, which has a worldwide organization. They have uh, branches in London, Singapore, other places. And she went to this boot camp. She, uh, she uh, actually, uh, we were on a, a meeting one time and uh, like just the lab meeting, and uh, she phoned in and uh, I'm like, Where's, where are you, Dordu? She said, Well, actually, I'm in Singapore. And so I was a little surprised, uh, but she, she had gone to Singapore um, to start this boot camp. And uh, um, I was really excited for her, actually, because it's a great opportunity to go there. And if you're willing to put in that level of commitment to learn about uh, what it's like to be a CEO and how to start a company, um, then that's great. Now, she invited me and also Jivesh uh, Kapoor, who is uh, another radiologist and works in Singapore, to be the founders uh, with her of this company, Meadow. And um, I initially, I was kind of confused. Well, what, what is this going to be? Uh, is this sort of like a school project or are we doing a real, a real company here? And um, it turned out to be very real eventually. And um, um, when we were founding Meadow, the concept, you know, there's a founding vision with any good, with, I think there has to be a vision of what you're building. So, um, you know, in the movie Gladiator, there was a dream that was Rome. You could only whisper it. Anything more than a whisper and it would vanish. It was so fragile. And so that's, um, you know, there's a dream that comes with building a company. I don't think it's just sort of a, you know, if it's going to be a company that's something that I would want to be associated with, there has to be something like that. There has to be a reason you're doing this that goes beyond just kind of, um, you know, just another thing to do or just a way to make a buck or something. So, um, Obviously, founding visions are pretty important uh, for the world's largest corporations and um, organizations. So uh, some of them are more favorable than others. Um, I'm personally a lot bigger fan of Google's original motto, don't be evil, than Facebook's motto of move fast and break things. Um, a vision where you're just moving fast and breaking things, it's worked for Facebook, but, uh, you know, and a just world without poverty is a nice example of a charitable organization having a very clear, simple founding vision. So luckily, I mean, this was not difficult for us to come up with the founding vision for Meadow because we had it, we were, it was already in our heads and you already heard it from Adam's introduction. Um, we want to create the 21st century stethoscope. And so what does the 21st century stethoscope mean? Well, in uh, the 20th century, the, the actual stethoscope was developed. And this is a tool which you put in your ears and um, a doctor holds over a patient's chest and you can listen to the heart. And so rather than just looking at the patients on the outside, you can hear what the heart is doing inside. You can go into the body. So that's great in the 20, 20th century. But nowadays, what we have is handheld portable ultrasound machines, little probes like you see hanging on the hook beside my, at home uh, beside my stethoscope. Um, and these, they're the same size. They plug into your, uh, into your tablet, or you can even plug it into a smartphone. And then it takes pictures inside the body, high resolution, dynamic imaging in the body. And you can just walk around with this in your backpack uh, or in the, the, the modern doctor's black bag, or even a bit like a tricorder in Star, in Star Trek. And so what we'd like to do with this handheld portable ultrasound is look inside the body and see what's going on. Now, because the pictures you get with ultrasound are noisy and grainy and made from confusing physical principles of acoustic refraction, it's hard to uh, understand those pictures unless you have quite a bit of training. And that's where we can combine it with artificial intelligence to understand the, to help give uh, users um, guidance and increased confidence as to how to take images and what the pictures are of. So that's the idea. We're building the 21st century stethoscope and that vision has powered uh, Meadow and uh, brings us back home whenever we, uh, whenever we uh, stray. Um, so that's great. Okay, we had a, uh, some academic stuff. Uh, we had a uh, vision. Now, how do we make this actually happen? As with most things in life, you need lots of money. So um, to do this, um, fortunately, there are many incubators and accelerators uh, helping technology startups these days. Um, Tech Edmonton, now defunct, but they were, uh, they were helpful. Uh, as Startup Edmonton, eHub, some other ones. Um, EF, we have to give a lot of credit to here in our case because uh, Dornush going to Singapore for this, uh, this boot camp, 
it was an incubator environment and um, it led actually to, uh, to the funding that we needed. Now, I've also previously been involved with another startup, which um, was initially just self-funded um, by the group of co-founders. Everyone was a physician and everyone had a bit of extra money and put some in. Um, other times, if there's no incubator or you have, if you have a wealthy friend or you just have an angel investor, then they can, they can put up the cash for it. You have to be sort of lucky to have that. And then there are grants. There's increasingly sets of grants that can be available from government or other uh, uh, organizations to uh, to help fund um, the uh, to help fund the process. So, <clears throat> just reviewing specifically what happened for Meadow, um, it was it started in the EF uh, Singapore incubator, and um, each of the people that was in the incubator was uh, starting a company and then going sort of in a dragon's den kind of environment, pitching their vision and trying to get uh, uh, the 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 various. Um, um, venture capitalists at the table to invest in it. And um, initially, this was a real struggle because there was a lot of controversy um, because Meadow had one full-time founder, which was Dornoush, and two part-time founders who were not quitting their day jobs. So that's myself and Jivesh. And everybody else at the in that whole incubator process was, um, and everyone they'd ever had in the past was full time. It was like a requirement that if you're going to do this, you need to not have any other work. You're full time as a as a founder of this company. You can't be a part time CEO. So um, that was very controversial. But um, Dornush successfully convinced um, the group that for this kind of a medical application, it's more useful to have your co founders be part time uh, or even most of the time. Um, in their own clinical and academic jobs, um, and then providing vision and support to the full-time uh, CEO. So once we reached that hurdle, we actually got the largest funding of anybody in the whole uh, sort of crop. And uh, it was led by Wavemakers, which is a, a, a big venture capital firm that, that has branches uh, all over the world. <clears throat> so that's great. So this money had been lined up. Um, now to make things happen, you need people. and so. It's very important that the people involved are reliable and trustworthy and committed to the project um, or to the company and, and that they're able to contribute meaningfully. Now, a lot of the time, uh, what I've seen around is that in, in people who are starting up, uh, who have a startup, it's this starts with family. And that's very true for Darnoush. Um, uh, she's, uh, she's got her arm around the neck of her uh, brother, Dinesh. Um, who has uh, my favorite hair of anybody. And, uh, and then there's uh, and Masood, her husband, uh, has been instrumental in making things happen and uh, others in her extended family. And um, on my side, uh, all of my children that, that you can see, uh, one giving the thumbs up, uh, these guys have been um, repeatedly scanned by ultrasound all throughout their young lives for the projects. So, um, you know, it's, it's a family. It starts with family. So, but you can't just work with family members. You need to have people who are bring specific skills to the table. Um, and I think it's quite a bit like growing a tree and you have to be very carefully pruning this tree. So um, trying, if a startup team is a small team, everybody on there, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's expensive to, to maintain people on the team. Um, and uh, you need to pick very carefully who's going to fit. So, um, a very core early person that we added to the team, for example, was David Quayle, who um, is uh, from his Bay Area serial entrepreneur and brought a lot of uh, real world business savvy to our group because we were a bit heavy on the academic side to start with. Um, you know, you have to make the right links and trust. And, um, you know, pruning is a tricky thing, like as an academic um, and it, I'm sort of a fundamentally positive uh, approach. And I really, I like, I find something to like about everybody. And so my academic team, um, you know, it, it, it's pretty rare for me to, uh, to remove someone from my academic team. Um, but, you know, an, but an industrial a startup company is not a union job. There's no job security. And there's, it, it, you need to, I, I find you need to be pretty ruthless about saying, okay, you're a great guy, but you just don't fit. Right. You need to, you know, you, you should be in the academic side or, you know, I, we can't work with you on this. I'm sorry. And I'm terrible at those conversations. Um, and luckily, I'm not the CEO. So Dornoush is the one who does those conversations. Um, but it is it's it's a very, you know, it's a crucial part of, the, of building a startup company is realizing who's not helping and who would help more and really being careful with that.
So uh, that's par part of why uh, we've gotten where we've got is by carefully building that team. Once you do have the right people, then um, you know it's great because you can actually have a lot of fun with them too. And um, that's a big part of it too. So building a startup team, it's important to recognize that no matter who you are, it is very difficult to recruit talented people. And we up here in Edmonton, we have a couple of liabilities. Um, first of all, we're paying everybody in Canadian dollars, uh, which, you know, if you compare that to the Bay Area, that's, that's not ideal. Um, and then of course, winter in Edmonton. Now, I personally, I love to cross country ski. I think that, uh, and, and downhill ski, I think Edmonton winters are actually not a liability, but there are many who do. So, uh, and another liability that we have as a startup is we're unproven unknown. Nobody knows if we're gonna be around next year. So, you know, we're not Google, you know. So um, these, are, uh, these are liabilities. However, we have assets. And one of the biggest assets is that vision, you know, clarity of vision, 21st century stethoscope. We're building something that is for everybody uh, to help with medical care all around the world. You know, we're not a cynical startup and that, that vision really attracts people. And a thing that I find, you know, as soon as people meet Dornouche and meet the other people on the team, the amount of fun we have together is very is a big asset. Like this is a group that enjoys coming to like just really enjoys seeing each other and, and relaxing together and and um, you know like the amount of laughter that we had about this chance meeting in Singapore where Jivesh and Dornouche ran into this guy, um, you know that was a that was a most entertaining uh, spectacle and uh, the the picture here um, you know the, the group picture from uh, the the Tech Edmonton um, area doesn't show. Um, this doesn't show the, the crazy dance party that happened afterwards. Um, you know, so this is, a, this is a fun crowd. And I think that uh, if you, you know, people really want to be part of a team that's really working together for a common vision and enjoying doing it. And that's something that, that, that Meadow can offer. And I think a successful startup has to offer that feeling. People don't just do stuff for money, you know. And so currently there are, and this changes regularly, there's approximately 24 employees, actual employees of Meadow. And then we have a whole sort of, uh, uh, you know, a wider range of people who are locums doing casual work or, la or labeling or students or collaborators that we work with. Um, it's based in Edmonton. Almost everyone is in Edmonton. There are, uh, there is a Singapore and um, uh, some, uh, we have labelers from uh, various other places as well. So, but the nucleus of it is in Edmonton and remains in Edmonton. So, now, so in addition to getting the right people, um, you need local help. You do need people to help out uh, setting, setting up your company. And luckily, this is a real asset that Edmonton has. The Edmonton community is extremely supportive of AI startups. So, um, you know, Amy, that, uh, that I'm now a fellow of, has been, uh, has been giving us their blessing. Um, Alberta Innovates has provided extensive financial support. Um, Tech Edmonton was helpful. My tax uh, pays for... Uh, uh, students who um, are co-paid by the company and by by my tax. Health Cities Edmonton was very useful in uh, you know, developing our initial contacts and connections. And um, I really have to credit uh, to University of Alberta, um, particularly Derek Emery, my chairman, for his vision and being willing to support this. And MIC, my radiology partnership, who um, uh, were able, there's, there are several people on, the, on MIC who are real, really visionary about uh, how you know, a radiology partnership is not just about uh, reading images, but about developing advanced ways to acquire and analyze the images and uh, just innovating within uh, radiology. So we had a very supportive community in the city and province. And um, I'm not sure that, you know, like, I'm not sure that everybody can say that in other in other jurisdictions. We're very lucky. So that's been very helpful for us. So all these things are great. Um, but then once you get kind of really started with the actual um, with the actual work, um, you need contracts and agreements. And in AI, what you really need is access to data. So where do you get all the medical data that's going to lead you to um, uh, you know to train your algorithms? Um, so, and this has been my work, quite a bit of my work over the last several years is ethics approvals, data transfer agreements, operational approvals, MOUs. So just pause for a second and think how much work it probably took, and I can confirm it, to generate an agreement between these organizations in red, Alberta Health Services, the University of Alberta, Meadow, and me. So to get these institutions to work together and come up with an agreement 
finally, to transfer data back and forth with the appropriate uh, safeguards and standards. I mean, you know, that was a day I needed a drink at the end of when we finally got that done. That's that was a big day when we got that agreement signed. Um, so, and, and these continue, you need to continue making MOUs and, and non-disclosure memorandum of understanding and non-disclosure agreements with any new organization or people that you talk to about your projects. And there's an ongoing need for that. Um, now, there's a need to navigate conflicts. Um, I mean, obviously, there are conflicts between people who work together. But like, what I mean by conflicts here is conflicts of interest. And I particularly, I wear so many hats that I have a lot of these. Conflict of interest, conflict of commitment, disclosures need to be made appropriately. I have to maintain my academic integrity, which is crucial to everything I do. And I have uh, a lot of obligations to the, my partners uh, at MIC and uh, my colleagues at the university and the AHS and to the wider community. And all of these need to be respected and um, you know, really are a source of strength, but, uh, but the whole, you know, but, but uh, figuring out the way to properly navigate this is also um, often very challenging. So anybody who's in a medical academic field uh, will have these kinds of conflicts or anybody who's coming from a, even a non-medical, suppose you're an engineer developing something, um, then these conflicts will come as well. So it just needs to be uh, carefully thought out and planned for at the start. Now, it, depending what kind of startup you have, there's a need to protect intellectual property. Um, Meadow is primarily a software company and software is something that is only sort of patentable. Some stuff in software can be patented and some stuff can't. Um, and often it's more important to just be there and be the first one there and have a large data set uh, than to actually patent. But we do have several key patents. Um, and there's a lot of strategy around this. First of all, should we get a patent at all? Then what do we patent? How extensive should we make the claims? Do we try to patent, you know, anything and everything, you make a super broad patent that will cover everything and make it so that no one else can do anything to do with ultrasound AI? Uh, or do you think, well, okay, that's just gonna be rejected. Uh, can we make a more narrow set of claims? What's more realistic? And you have to then think where to patent it. Should this be going to Canada? Should it be going to the United States, China, European Union? I mean, there are 200 countries in the world. Where do you decide to patent? Because everybody has a patent process. Every country, it costs money in every, you know, time and money uh, to file in every country. And it's an ongoing process with all these different deadlines and all these different renewals and going from provisional to pending. All, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a mysterious land. I'm not an expert in this, but, um, you know, Meadow has a sort of a, a group that works on these patents and uh, maintains and expands them. So you have to think about your IP. Uh, you definitely need to protect yourself in some way to make sure that the other guys don't just do what you were planning. So then um, in the medical field and in any, especially in the medical field, you need to have regulatory approvals. Um, and this is obviously for the protection of the whole population. You know, like you can't just release, you know, untested medical devices on people. Uh, you know, if you're going to make a, if you're going to make a vaccine, you got to make sure it doesn't have a microchip in it to track you, for example, or, you know, if you're going to make a, um, you know, a device like ours, which is a class two medical device, which is a tool to, you know, make diagnoses on patients, um, then you need some stuff. And in Canada, um, there's investigational testing authorization. So you can't even test your device on a patient without having this, this ITA in place. And so, um, we didn't even know this till we got, we, we got a grant, the um, Alberta Innovates gave us a big grant to study uh, hip dysplasia with our tool. And um, we realized as we were making the grant application that, oh no, we can't even do anything without having this ITA. So we had to back up and, you know, <laughs> make that the, the first, uh, first step. Then you need a medical device establishment license. So your company is like licensed to try to make devices. And then for each specific device, you need a medical device license. In the United States, there's the uh, Food and Drug Administration has to clear you. In Europe, there's the um, European Union, there's the CE mark. Um, the UK has just uh, Brexited, so it's a different process there now. Uh, Australia has, a, has one, you know. So the question is, again, you know, not only are you patenting in certain regions, you're deciding what regulatory approvals to get and in which regions. So Meadow so far has got um, Canadian and US. Um, the key one is the American one. If you have a US FDA clearance, then a lot of stuff can follow from that. So but we, have, uh, we have approvals in two different uh, uh, types of ultrasound. 
And these letters, again, just like that, uh, F, that uh, data transfer agreement, you know, it's occasion for a celebration when you get a letter like this, you know, investigational testing authorization approved, you know, FDA clearance approved. So those are, those are big days in the company when, when that happens. So all that's great. You need a product. Okay. Um, our, what we did is we, we went from our academic pilot work in 2016, 17, which was totally buggy. Like it could be used by a computer programmer, but the moment that Amazon web servers made a tiny adjustment to their format um, within the, the whole thing crashed and just wouldn't work. So we had to build it from scratch um, within the Meadow environment. And um, we did, we built this beautiful tool. It made 3D models of the hip. Um, it produced a little bar graph showing the probability of hip dysplasia. It drew lines. You could, you, it was a user interface. You could move the lines around, put them where you wanted to. You could adjust the angles. You know, this is like this really cool tool. I was super excited that we were all excited that we made this tool. This is what we got FDA approved. You could use it online on a web browser. And then we went out to clinics um, to try this out. And um, basically it was a disaster. It crashed, it was way too complicated. People just were not, in, you know, it just wasn't working. It was too slow. The, basically we discovered <laughs> through these sort of informal focus groups, i.e. the users that we were trying to, uh, trying to convince to use our version one product, that in fact, what people want is to see a big green check mark. This hip is healthy. Like people want, you know, to know that their scan is of good enough quality to make a diagnosis and that the diagnosis is good. That's what they want to see. And they want to see it really fast. So we, we started again from scratch, uh, version two, which is really version three, completely redid the whole thing, took six months of computer program time. Um, but then we developed an app which runs on an Android tablet and just watches while the patient scans. And as soon as you've got enough, um, enough images, um, it just blinks green. You're good. And this suddenly, this product now, when you run it, it brings such a smile because everyone who uses it is just like, oh, wow. So it just works. You know, the old product was not like that. And this product is actually, you know, there's a, there's, there's a sort of a philosophy. You're trying to make the minimum, the minimum uh, acceptable product or the minimum, but then there's the minimum lovable product. So is your product lovable? And I personally think we've achieved that in the hip and we've done it with, through this extensive process of field testing, which was much larger than I had expected that we would have to do, you know, clinics, hospital, user, many users of different experience. So basically the moral of the story there is you need a product that people actually want to use. Then you need marketing. Now, we're not at the stage where we have like ads out, you know, we're not advertising on TV or Facebook or something. Um, what we're actually doing is, uh, you know, we have a network of development sites, places around the Edmonton region and also places at big institutions across the world where people are trying this out and helping us to develop the, uh, the, the algorithms. And so you need a lot of connections for this. And um, eventually it becomes a whole department of the startup company. Uh, we don't, we're not quite there yet, uh, but, uh, you know, it's crucial to like figure out a way to expand your reach. You also need a business plan. Um, now, again, as an academic, I'm not, you know, skilled in writing business plans. This was not something that I, you know, had a knack for. Um, but uh, Dornush learned quite a bit about it at EF and we have uh, business minded folks in the group now. So um, things in a business plan, there's a long-term vision. You have to think, what is the total addressable market? Like who, like who, if you had every single, if you cornered the market and you had a monopoly, who is all the people that would buy this product? Who are the actual users? Um, you know, you, there's this process of validation where you're proving that these users do exist. Um, so you have to think long-term, what's your ultimate goal? And then you have to have the short-term deliverables. And very importantly, there has to be cash flow. So. Uh, the way I like to think of this, um, I've got this on this screen, you can see pictures of the LRT bridge that was uh, recently being built in, in uh, Northeast Edmonton. And this bridge, they started with a tower and they built the cantilever beams out uh, on both sides, just built them out further and further till they reached the other side. Now, obviously the, in the last picture, it's completely stable because it's all attached, but that bridge has to stand up every minute of construction. It has to be balanced. It has to have, you know, you can't let the forces and loads topple it at any point. And that's true with the company too. Like the bills have to be paid every month. You know, um, there's, 
you have to like your plan can't just have the vision that oh there someday will be a bridge from one side of the river to the other there has to be every minute of it it has to be not falling down so this is tricky <laughs> this is a challenge uh, money is always tight in a startup um there's you know when to go for uh to investors there's a seed round which meadow did uh, quite a while ago now and was very successful in there's series a and series b which is where you go back to the investors and say we're big enough now we have you know this many milestones now we have revenue what can you give us some more money to build further um and investors want to see that the, the company is attractive they want to think well where is their exit you know like like people like me, Darnush, and Jivesh are in this for the, the vision. Like, uh, like, I don't want to leave until there's a 21st century stethoscope being actually used. But a lot of people along the way are interested in, you know, a high return on investment, quickly getting their money out. And, um, you know, we need people like that uh, because they have lots of money and they're used to making, turning money into more money. And it's important to figure out ways that they are happy so that the money appears to pay everyone's bills. So um, all that is kind of not my... Forte, but uh, but it is crucial to the business. So, and part of a business plan involves expansion. And one of the the second business case or the second use case that um, that Meadow is working on is thyroid ultrasound. And just very briefly, um, this is um, thyroid is a type of ultrasound scanning which is time consuming to do. Often people have their thyroid gland has lots of lumps in it especially women have many, many nodules in the thyroid. Many of them are benign. Some of them are suspicious for malignancy. It's very tedious for a, a human observer to do these ultrasound scans and measure all the nodules and try to work them out. So basically radiology clinics um, and physicians and radiologists would find it very useful uh, to have a automated tool which does as much of that process automatically as possible. And this is a, um, something that, uh, you know, if it can be done automatically, it can be rolled out widely. People with less training can do it. It can be less expensive. It can be put all over the place. And so I'm very proud of how we've been able to develop this in close collaboration with uh, my radiology partnership, MIC. We're testing the thing in clinics. Um, you know, we have sonographers from MIC who are working on it. The IT staff at MIC are working to integrate it within the, within the uh, hardware environment. So it's, it's kind of in the process of being birthed. And once it's fully born, it's a product that should just be, could just be sold directly to radiology groups and revenue starts coming in. So it's, um, that'll help to support the long-term vision and um, is a, a, an important part of our business plan. And just to show, uh, we're planning to do other, other body parts. Um, you can take the, the AI, which is, has learned to recognize bone and dark structures, which are cartilage, and you can train it to recognize bone in the shoulder. You can train it to recognize dark structures like nodules in the liver or thyroid. You can recognize other organs. You can look at the heart. So we have lots of dreams, lots of different places we wanna go and um, wanna do it in real time to help users get better images. And we wanna integrate hardware uh, directly, potentially. It's a lot of talk about that. So that's where Meadow is right now. We'll just take a couple minutes to, I'm almost done. We'll just take a couple minutes to evaluate the path that we've taken. If you, you know, reflecting on it where we've been, we've actually um, had, uh, um, our actual path was we first built this tool, artificial intelligence analysis of hip ultrasound. Um, pretty cool tool, <laughs> but we didn't know if anyone was gonna use it. So we step two, we've checked out that the tool works. Great, it was working. Lots of scientific testing, publications. Then we went to users and tried to figure out whether there was a clinical need for this thing. Now, this is a bit like saying we have a solution in search of a problem. And a lot of like, you know, academic enterprises, a lot of academic things uh, are like this. Solutions in search of a problem. Is this something anyone actually wants? You know, ideally what you should do is start with the user and the need. So you say to yourself, okay, you, you, you talk to people who are actually using in a certain field and they identify for you, this is what I wish I had. Then you say, okay, now we're going to go build that and then we'll come back to you and prove that it works and then we'll be answering the need directly. I mean, in a perfect world, that's how it goes. But in real life, of course, most academics are building stuff already and then go try and find a user. But you just have to keep it in mind. <laughs> you have to keep it in mind that it really should be looking at whether anyone's gonna actually need this thing. So 
if we take a global perspective on meadow vision, we got this right, definitely. I'm very proud of the 21st century stethoscope. This is, we're working towards that vision. It's crystal clear, that's what we want. Our path, we started backwards, but we're working the right way around now uh, with our new use cases and asking people what other, what, what, what should we do next? Uh, we've built a team very well. Dornusha takes the primary credit for that. She has the ultimate vision of who to hire and who to let go. And when we do have someone in the team, they're really welcomed. Product development is very inefficient. Uh, we've learned a lot of lessons. We're getting faster at developing stuff. Um, and marketing, upscaling, expansion, that's all work in progress. That's kind of where we're at right now. And um, so in conclusion, um, building a startup company from academia, I think the main goal is to have a real impact, do some, take academic work and really bring it to the world. And success needs so many things, vision, a team, a product people want, IP, regulatory, marketing uh, strategies, a business plan, humility and good fortune. And I think really a focus at the end of the day that it's for the people. And so I've, I work with so many people and I'm and so grateful to have the support of everybody from Meadow and MIC and the university and my family. And uh, that it's, you know, the, one should never lose sight of that. So I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, part of Meadow and uh, really proud of where we are at and very excited to see where we go next. So uh, that's all I have. I certainly can take some questions uh, as you wish. Awesome. What a fantastic presentation, Jacob. That was, that was awesome. Um, I think there, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but if anybody has a question, it uh, looks like Ali has a, their hand up. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jacob. I, I just have to say, wow, it was a great presentation. First of all, a great title and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of what you mentioned, uh, I guess uh, I could relate to it myself because I'm in the process of what you went, you or Dornush went in a couple of years back. So I, I, I had a, a lot of fun listening to you. I have written down four questions, which I'm sure I won't have the time to ask. I'll just start with one question. And then if we have time, I'll, I'll give the opportunity for other people to ask questions as well. There's this dilemma for people who start from academia. We, we do applied research or we start research somewhere, maybe not even having the intention of, of commercializing uh, something out of it. But then it, it, it reaches a step where you can do commercialization and you start working on that. Um, but then to keep that going on, you redirect if you do your research program at the university to accommodate what you are doing in the private world. Is that, has that been an issue for you? Is that a dilemma? Is that something to worry about from an ethical perspective that we were, we were doing research for the sake of research. And then there were other people who would come in and say, okay, this research is good. We can apply it. This is basic science. We don't, you know, we can't apply it, but it's good research. But now our researchers, myself included, um, are thinking about how can I accommodate my private business by doing research that would fit in the academia? I don't have an answer for that. That's why yeah. I wanted to get your opinion. Yeah. Well, I don't have an answer either. And that, that's why I put that slide up about conflicts, because that is, you know, a core conflict there. Like, are, is your research intended, um, you know, is this research intended for personal or private gain, or is this research intended for, you know, an academic interest and how do you balance those things? And the way that, that I look at it, um, well, it's interesting because almost everybody who's a researcher in AI has their startup company, as far as I could tell, everyone's got a conflict they're declaring. But my view on it is that um, I am still, that, that I, that's why I like my vision of the 21st century stethoscope. Like I'm not doing this so that I can increase my bank account. Like I'm doing this so that I can, um, you know, bring, bring my research to more impact in the world. And that's something that's enthusiastically supported at the university actually. So the university wants you to, to do this, to translate into something with real impact where you're, you know, creating jobs. And, and, uh, and so it's, you know, there's a lot of support for it. It has to be just done very openly. It's just very clear that, you know, the way I look at it is that my research group does um, validation of, uh, like on the academic side, we're testing out all kinds of new, what can you do with ultrasound and AI? And then the, certain of those things, maybe it works great, but there's not really a market for it or something. It's just an academically interesting thing. But some of those things are useful commercially and those get sort of 
transferred over to uh, to Meadow to go and look into. So that's kind of how I've structured it, and I have no perfect answer. Very complicated, but uh, you know, I feel that to make it feel comfortable for myself, like the reason I'm doing this is to is for my research to have an impact. And so as long as I keep centered on that, then um, then then that uh, you know that plus being transparent and open about it with everybody uh, is how I, my way forward. I see a whole bunch of questions popping up there now. Awesome. Uh, Jacob Walward, uh, would you mind just unsharing your screen? I'm just going to throw up a, a feedback oh, sure. link on there. But uh, I, do, I do see a question from, uh, where is it now? I lost it. From Michael. So you mentioned inefficiencies in product development. What are some prime examples uh, and how did you reduce the inefficiency? Or if you haven't, what would you do differently? <laughs> Yeah, so the main inefficiency was just not being user centered about it. That was our initial, you know, um, we were extremely inefficient because we we didn't really design it initially with the user in mind, and we had to restart a couple times, as, as I was saying. But there are other inefficiencies too. Like some of it's unavoidable. Like when you start with like a proof of concept work, maybe you start writing it in MATLAB um, just to try it out, basically get the pseudocode kind of, and then you run it. Um, and then you back up and you realize, oh no, I need to design a database that's scalable so that like I can have like not just 10 cases, but what if someone's giving me a thousand cases? I probably need to restart and rebuild the entire database. So um, we've done numerous restarts, like, you know, reboot, restart, redo it again. And so what I could give as advice would be to, if you do think this is going to go somewhere, to back up and take your time at the beginning to design it to potentially grow. Like if you're building a set of code, you know, design it so that all the all the blocks can fit together in a way that you can just bolt in cleverly later. You know, you don't want to sort of make one massive script, for example, right? <laughs> you want to build it in a way that's that's scalable. So it's worth some time and energy at the start to think about what if this became really big? Would my code still work? Would my approach work? So. Awesome. Uh, just for everybody watching the, the QR code on the screen there, I'm going to post a link as well. Just a quick uh, feedback survey. It's like, I think it's about two questions long and take you 20 seconds to do if you wouldn't mind uh, doing that for us. We also want to get some feedback from all of you. Um, but we do have some other, another question here from, uh, from Matt. What suggestions do you have for students thinking of joining a startup versus a larger, more well-established company? Well, I think the student should know thyself, like know thyself. You have to know what you, what to expect and what will fit well with you. They're totally different things. Like, um, you know, in a, in a well-established company, you're likely to be sort of a, a cog in the wheel. There's a more like, it's a more defined role. There's a hierarchy, you know, you've got job security, you might have benefits, you might have the prestige of being associated with a big name. Um, and you could, you know, potentially advance your career very nicely along a certain path in there. Um, with a startup like ours, you have no job security whatsoever. The whole thing could just vanish, you know, at any time, right? So you have to be prepared for that. But you may potentially, but your potential gain from it in terms of like your experience uh, fitting in and developing, like it's great to be in at the inception of something because you can carve your own role. Um, but you have to be prepared for the uncertainty and stress of it and probably work more hours too. Like it's a ton of work to be in a startup. So if you're willing to go all in and you don't have, you know, a whole bunch of mouths to feed that you're worried about, <laughs> you know, then, then it could be, I personally think it's much more fun to be part of a startup, but I think that, you know, you have to recognize what you really, what your goals and personality are. <laughs> so they're very different being in a startup and an established company. And you just need to know that going in. <laughs> yeah, awesome advice. Uh, another question on here, how many individual scans were needed to optimize sensitivity and specificity? Mm. So that depends. I mean, ultrasound is interesting because you have, for every patient, you for every scan, you have 200 images. So if you think of each image as it's uh, as an individual data unit, you can have, you can be training on, you know, you could easily train on 100,000 images and not have that many patients. We've experienced, we've, we've found that, you know, if you have, um, several hundred to a thousand patients, you can often have quite nice results. Um, in some cases, you can get good results with a hundred patients, um, but that uh, you have to be cautious about overfitting. The smaller your data set is, the more you have to be careful about uh, whether you're fitting your data and not, not sort of the general population. So 
and different and different neural networks can handle different levels. Like one of the advances coming is that the networks are getting smarter using less data to train with. So that's a work in progress. Cool, awesome. That yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but we have time for one last question if someone out there wants to unmute and ask a question live. I've already unmuted myself, but <laughs> if, if somebody else wants to ask a question, I already have asked one. All right, go for it, Ali. Why not? <laughs> so, Jacob, is patent really worth it? Uh, because you, you have to get every detail out and it's going to get published. And I've heard concerns about, uh, you know, you get things, you, you get every detail out and then somebody clever comes out and takes that, the, the, that procedure, tweaks it around to make good enough of a claim that they're doing something different. And then they go out and take your. Yeah. I, I think it's, um, I don't think it's mandatory to patent in the software world. I think it's, you know, there's hardware, like you better have a patent. If you're gonna build a, a widget, you better have your widget patented. Like that's pretty, to me, that's pretty clear. In software though, like, you know, there are lots of different ways an AI algorithm can train on, you know, lots of slightly different ways that you can train an AI algorithm on a data set. So it's probably more important to have your data and to have your connections and to become an established player in the field than to worry too much about patent per se. So patents are good, it's great to have them, but I wouldn't sort of go all in on patenting stuff. Nice, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jacob, for that awesome presentation. And thanks everybody for the, the awesome questions too. It was a very engaging chat uh, and discussion right from the start. So thank you very much. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, to join us here. And I hope that you've had a great startup week so far. And uh, maybe you can finish one or get fit one or two more Startup Week events in after this. Um, but thanks again, Jacob. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks very much, Adam. And thanks, everyone, for, for coming. That was great. Have a good day. Bye, everybody.